Welcome. In this video, we look at section 2.6, the Cauchy criterion. This is another way to determine if a sequence converges. Here's the idea. So we have a sequence, and it's on this number line. The terms of the sequence are plotted out, and it looks like it's converging to something on the right there. And what I did in the past to determine if a sequence converges is I say, well, there's some L, and it happens that there's some index big N so that once I get to term uh, a sub big N, then all the terms after a sub big N are within, say, epsilon of L. But in this situation, for Cauchy sequences, I might not know what that limit is. But one thing I can say from this picture is that it looks like after some point, all the terms in the tail are within a certain length of each other. For example, maybe one-tenth. Maybe this distance here is one-tenth. And so maybe it happens that in my sequence that all the terms in the tail are within one-tenth of each other eventually. So if I pick any two terms, they're within a tenth. Or maybe I want to be even more exact. Perhaps I say that given epsilon, all the terms in my tail are within epsilon of each other. So this is the idea of Cauchy sequences. Can I guarantee that all the terms in the tail, if I go out far enough into the tail, that all the terms will be within a certain distance of each other? So informally, we say that the sequence a sub n, this is a Cauchy sequence, if we can find an index big N that makes all the terms after a sub big N very close to each other. Here it is officially. A sequence A is called a Cauchy sequence if, for every epsilon greater than zero, there exists a big N such that, given any two indices greater than or equal to that big N, the distance between those two terms, the nth term and the mth term, that distance is less than epsilon. Right, so in the picture above, uh, given any epsilon, there exists a capital N, so maybe there's my a sub n right there, so that for all m and n greater than epsilon, so all these terms have index greater than or equal to big N, that all of those terms are within epsilon of each other. So it's telling us about the tail, how, how tightly the terms of the sequence are compacted in the tail of the sequence. Here's a picture. It's a little bit different from my usual one. So you have to uh, tilt your head on the side, perhaps. My x-axis is vertical. And the horizontal axis in this picture gives us the, uh, the term number. As I move down the sequence, the terms do look like they're getting closer and closer and closer to each other. In fact, after, I don't know, maybe is this the, the 50th term? If I come up here, there's that. I can come across. And let's just make up a number. How about one-tenth again? So after the 50th term, all the terms in the tail of the sequence are within one-tenth of each other. Here's an example of a Cauchy sequence, simply the sequence 1 over n, 1, 1 half, 1 third, 1 fourth. Um, a, a little bit later I will prove that this is a Cauchy sequence, but I just want to give us a sense of why it is at this point. And maybe you can see why. You know, After, say, the fifth term of the sequence, every term is w within one-fifth of each other. And let's say that I'm looking at two terms in this sequence that are beyond the 100th term of the sequence. Well, those are going to be within 100th of each other. So all the terms of my sequence after the 100th term, if I take any two of those, they will be within 1 100th of each other. Now here's an example of a sequence that is not Cauchy, although it might look like it is at first. This is the sequence of partial sums of the harmonic series. Now, consecutive terms get closer and closer. So the first term of the sequence is 1, and then after that, the next term of the sequence is 1 plus a half, so there's a difference of a half, and then the term after that is 1 plus a half plus a third, so I only want a third more, and after that, 1 plus a half plus a third plus a fourth. So 
the, the terms, the consecutive terms of the sequence are getting closer and closer. However, this sequence of partial sums grows without bounds because we know the harmonic series diverges. So the terms in the tail don't get close. Here's a picture. So you can see, as I go down the sequence, right, my, my, uh, my sequence is growing more and more and more, but it grows more and more slowly, but I do know that it grows without bounds. But also, I can see that consecutive terms of the sequence are getting closer. So that's not enough to tell us that the sequence is Cauchy, just the fact that consecutive terms are getting closer. But for this sequence, it grows without bound, so the, uh, the terms in the tail don't stay very close to each other. Here's an idea called the Cauchy criterion. It turns out a sequence converges if and only if it is a Cauchy sequence. Ah, so these Cauchy sequences actually aren't very mysterious. Cauchy sequences are exactly sequences that converge. Now, the nice thing is, though, that like the monotone convergence theorem, here we have a condition for convergence that doesn't require knowing a limit. I don't have to know where the sequence goes in order to determine that it actually converges. Let's prove this. So in the forward direction, I want to prove that if a sequence converges, then it is a Cauchy sequence. All right, so the sequence converges, so let's let x be uh, the limit of uh, the sequence. And so by definition, I know that for any epsilon greater than zero, there's some index big N, so that if little n is greater than or equal to big N, then the term x sub n is within, say, epsilon over two of x. I can require that it's within epsilon over two. And also, let's just change variables a little bit. If I have a little m that is greater than or equal to big N, then that term, x sub m, is also within epsilon over 2 of x. So do you see where this is going? So it's not so bad. I'm skipping some details here. But we could use the triangle inequality then to prove that if n and m are both greater than big N, then the difference between xn and xm uh, that distance is less than epsilon. In fact, that will be part of your homework to uh, finish up the details there. How about the other direction? Now we want to prove that if my sequence is Cauchy, then the sequence converges. This one takes a little bit more work, but it's not too bad. First, we need a lemma. So here's how it goes. I'm going to use this fact. If a sequence is a Cauchy sequence, it turns out it is bounded. So why is that? All right. So let's just set our epsilon as 1, okay? Now, since it's Cauchy sequence, I know that with an epsilon equals 1, I can go somewhere out in my sequence, some index big N, so that for all indices beyond that big N, that the terms of the sequence are within one of each other. So, in fact, if they're all within one of each other, then they must all be within one of that x sub big N. It's like I have my uh, x axis here, and there's some x sub big N, and all the terms of the sequence after that are within one of each other, within one of each other. So certainly they are within one of x sub big N. But then that also tells me that what is the biggest that any of those terms can be? Well, they can't be any bigger than the x sub big N plus 1. So back to the little picture here, if I, if I add 1 to that, there's my x sub big N plus 1. Yeah, all the, uh, all the terms in that tail are less than uh, x sub big N plus 1. And so, if I let M be the maximum of, let's see, term x1, term x2, term x3, and then all the way up uh, to the tail, and then all the terms in the tail, I've discovered that uh, all the terms of my sequence, all the terms of my sequence have to be less than or equal to m. So m is a bound for that sequence. And I know I've, I was a little fast and loose here by not saying the word absolute value. I, if, I, if I keep saying absolute value too much, it just sounds, sounds too much. Uh, but what, what I've said here is actually holding true uh, with absolute values.
Okay, so that's the lemma. If it's Cauchy, then it's bounded. So we have that fact, and let's use that fact uh, for the rest of our proof. So I want to prove that if my sequence is a Cauchy sequence, then the sequence converges. All right, so let x sub n be a Cauchy sequence. By the preceding lemma, I know that this sequence is bounded. And look, now I can use the bolzano weierstrass theorem. Since it's bounded, it has a convergent subsequence, x sub n sub k. All right, now let x be the limit of that subsequence. My goal is to show that the original sequence converges. Well, at least I know there's a convergent subsequence. Let x be the limit of that subsequence. And I'm thinking what I'm going to do down the road is really show that my, my sequence itself actually converges to that same x. Let epsilon greater than zero be given. Now, since my sequence is Cauchy, there is an index, big N, so that for my indices m and n greater than that, I know that the difference between the terms, x sub n and x sub m, that is less than, say, epsilon over 2. I can require less than epsilon over 2. But look, also, since I know that my subsequence converges to a particular limit, I know that I can find a subscript big enough in that subsequence so that the difference between x sub n sub big K and x, that's also less than epsilon over 2. Ah, now we're getting close. All right, here are the two lines again from the previous slide. Observe that if little n is greater than or equal to big N, then x sub n minus x, I can do this trick of subtracting and adding that term of the subsequence, then breaking it apart using the triangle inequality. But I showed that each of those was less than epsilon over 2. Add them together, we get epsilon, and that's the end of the proof. All right, I was able to show that this sequence that I knew was Cauchy actually converges. It had a subsequence that was convergent, I saw that it converged to x, and so then I was able to show that in my original sequence that the terms got arbitrarily close to x. Okay, let's do an example using the definition of Cauchy, and we'll prove that this sequence 1 over n is a Cauchy sequence. So how would a proof like that go? I need to look at the difference of two arbitrary terms, a sub n and a sub m. And so that's the absolute value, 1 over n minus 1 over m, and a little bit of algebra takes us here. I've dropped the absolute value in the denominator because n and m are both positive integers. They're, they are indices of the sequence. And at this point, we might get actually a little stuck. I must show that if m and n are very large, then this quantity is very small. And that's true in the denominator. Looking at the, just the denominator, if n and m are very large, then that denominator is huge. But there's a problem in the numerator, because even if m and n are very large, there might be a very great uh, distance between the two of them. The, the difference between m and n could be huge. So how do I actually guarantee that this whole fraction is actually quite small? And we might have to think about it for a little bit, but there's a nice little trick when you look at that numerator. That numerator, m minus n, the absolute value, m minus n, is actually less than the maximum of m and n. Do you see that? So pause the video if you need to think about that for a little bit. Um, and then there's a cancellation that takes place. Perhaps m was the max, so then I'd have m over n m and the m's would cancel, giving me 1 over n. Or perhaps n was the max. If n was the max, I have n over nm. My n's cancel, I get 1 over m. So eventually, one of these things cancels, and really all I'm left with is 1 over the minimum of those two numbers. Ah, now I'm starting to see if m and n are very big, that will be a very small number. OK. Let's go back to the beginning. I want the difference of my two arbitrary terms to be less than epsilon. I can make sure that happens if I guarantee that 1 over the minimum of m and n is less than epsilon. Do you see how that implication works? Previously, we saw that the difference of a n, a m, 
was less than 1 over the min. So certainly if 1 over the min is less than epsilon, then that difference in absolute value will be less than epsilon. But this expression is equivalent to saying that the minimum of m and n is greater than 1 over epsilon. Okay, so in, in the pre-proof, this is exactly what I want. I have some criterion that will guarantee that my difference of terms in absolute value is less than epsilon. Okay, let's get to the official proof part. Let epsilon greater than zero be given. Choose big N so that big N is greater than one over epsilon. Now, if M and N are greater than big N, then the minimum of those two is certainly greater than or equal to N, and so uh, consequently the minimum of those two must be greater than one over epsilon. Ah, now I can use the star statement. By the star, this implies that the difference in absolute value of these two terms, a n, a m, that difference is less than epsilon. And so that proves the result. And once again, just a nice observation, there's no need to know the limit beforehand to prove convergence. Now, of course, we know this sequence converges to zero, but we actually didn't have to use that fact anywhere in this proof. Go through the proof and double check. Never did we actually use the fact that one over n converges to zero. All right, how about a non-example? How might we use the definition of Cauchy to show that a sequence isn't a Cauchy sequence. So here's our example here, our non-example, the sequence n over 10. So the sequence looks like 1 tenth, uh, 2 tenths, 3 tenths, 4 tenths, and so on. What do we actually need to show in order to show that it's not Cauchy? Okay, be very careful we are negating the criterion for Cauchy. I need to show that there exists some epsilon greater than zero, so that for any capital N, there's some choice of indices M and N so that the difference of terms is greater than or equal to epsilon. Right, kind of maybe go through and see how all the quantifiers have been changed. Okay, let's try epsilon equals one. I will prove that the terms in the tail of this sequence eventually get bigger than one. All right, so let any capital N be given. Uh, I can take, that's like my A sub N and my A sub M. My little N is the capital N itself, and my little M is N plus 20. And look what happens. I get N over 10 minus N plus 20 over 10, and that's two, right? In fact, by, by manipulating these subscripts a little bit, I could make this difference as large as I want. But my epsilon was one, so I only need to find something bigger than one, and so why not? I was able to find subscripts that make my difference actually two, which was greater than that epsilon. All right, so that is the Cauchy criterion. You know, when you first learn about Cauchy sequences, it sounds mysterious, but in fact, it's just another way of saying <laughs> convergent sequences. Cauchy sequences are exactly convergent sequences. It's just another way of describing them. All right, and I will stop there.